Grand Risings and welcome to Conversations on the Spiritual Journey. I'm Ron Usha and today again I'm speaking with Sana. Grand Rising, Sana. Grand Rising. Ran, hello. Yeah. We spoke with Sana a few weeks ago and uh, we spoke about her um, introduction into spirituality, her upbringing, her introduction into meditation. So today, so we won't go into that bio now. If you want to look at the bio, please go back to the first conversation. So today we're going to go into her work at the moment and how her spirituality infuses in her work. So Sana, could you tell us about what you're doing now? Yeah, so uh, I'm currently working on uh, actually um, on my own projects and more building my freelance uh, career. Uh, so I launched this, um, uh, my platform, it's called Inclusive Journalism. I call it a platform, but it's actually, um, the main thing now is the newsletter I started uh, three weeks ago. So I call it Inclusive uh, Journalism because it's actually, uh, that uh, terminology involves all the um, uh, media diversity uh, equity topic I'm uh, writing about and I'm um, experienced in, and also the um, holistic view on uh, journalism. And that comes more from my uh, spiritual and also coaching uh, background. So um, I launched the newsletter three weeks ago. So that's a weekly uh, newsletter. Uh, and I also do a lot with Instagram. I developed a course also for uh, journalists uh, and activists and other people who want to use the platform in a in a journalistic way. Um, so uh, yeah, that's that are two of my projects uh, at the moment. And I still write a lot about uh, the topic of inclusive journalism as well. So um, what work needs to be done when we're talking about inclusiveness in journalism? A lot of work. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, so I think a lot of work needs to be done, but where I focus mainly on uh, white uh, journalists who work in uh, Western societies. Uh, and um, I think that's where a lot of work needs to be uh, done. Because when we talk about inclusion and diversity, we also talk about uh, the culture of whiteness and uh, white privilege, um, all these kind of things. And I mean, it's not a secret that a lot of white people still have a lot of blind spots towards racism because they never experience it. Uh, and I think the work that needs to be done is to, um, yeah, to help uh, or yeah, to educate uh, journalists and people who work in media on these topics and also to um, create certain uh, tools or frameworks in how to um, uh, improve journalism in a sense that it becomes more inclusive. Uh, and that's not so easy because I mean, um, yeah, you know, if you talk about blind spots, it also has a lot to do with self-reflection, you know, and you cannot, you can make a course uh, to learn uh, somebody something about uh, very concrete uh, things like how to become more productive in your work, for example. Uh, but it's very hard to um, create something for people to become more aware of certain things that they don't see at the moment. So, um, yeah, I'm also in touch with other people who are uh, working in this topic. And we discuss a lot about um, this kind of things, like uh, which tools or which frameworks uh, can be useful for this. And there are some of some of the frameworks are developed already. But uh, yeah, that's what I'm um, that that's the work that needs to be uh, done. So what is whiteness? Who? what is whiteness? You can better um, ask it to, well, let me, let me phrase it. Uh, I don't have the exact phrase, I think, but 
I, w I wanted to uh, name uh, Kehinde Andrews. Uh, I'm not sure if I uh, pronounce his name uh, well, he's British. <laughs> Uh, he's a professor of black studies and I'm quite a big fan of his work actually because uh, I came across his work last year and he uh, uh, he was actually the first person who this uh, that I came across that this who described whiteness for me uh, and whiteness is not necessarily uh, only applicable to white people that's why I'm sometimes also a little bit reluctant to say I focus on white journalists because it's uh, it can also be people of color who grow up in uh, a Western society, uh, which is based on whiteness, uh, that uh, are living in the same framework. So um, whiteness actually uh, means that uh, the whole framework you grow up in or you live in is based on the fact that uh, white people are the default. So. Um, yeah, I think that's the that's the explanation that I have on top of my uh, mind at this moment, and that's uh, I think the core of what whiteness uh, is. And it means so it means also that white skin color is put superior uh, to other uh, skin colors, uh, and that's embedded in the race theory that has become very popular in Enlightenment. Uh, enlightenment times the end of 19th uh, century if I'm correct uh, and that's actually that became so famous uh, amongst uh, philosophers and uh, scientists that um, yeah the, uh, the American society is actually built upon the culture of whiteness uh, upon the culture of the white race being superior uh, to other uh, races. Does this mean then that journalists, when investigating, have to first look at their own biases? Because I guess they're viewing the world through a certain paradigm. Yeah. And are they looking at their own intrinsic biases when writing? Yeah, so that's a very important point uh, in regard to journalists, because I think um, I worked in media for 13 years or so in the Netherlands before I left and came to Asia. And there is really an idea in, uh, at least in the places where I worked, and I could say in general in Western journalism, that there is an idea that objectivity is possible, that when you, um, uh, that when you grow up in a Western society and you, you're a journalist in Europe or the US, you have this idea of that your point of view at the world is, has, is objective. Whereas I would say um, that's not the case because you also come from a certain framework. So it's exactly what you're saying. Um, you need to understand that the lens through which you see the world is a different one than the lens uh, people in other places and regions in the world uh, see the same reality. Uh, and if you're not aware of that, um, yeah, then that's a blind spot. So have you discovered on this journey you're on, have you discovered things about yourself that you didn't know? Own biases? Yeah. Uh, that yeah, 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 that's a very good question uh, because I'm actually, uh, last few months I'm thinking about it more and more how important it is that I also share those experiences, you know, because um, I sometimes even forget that I went through all that all, or a lot of experiences already uh, because it's sometimes it's so subtle. Um, so, um, yeah, um, I have multiple examples, but what, uh, yeah, I have one example. Um, uh, I just notice actually when I, when I think of this, how that there's a certain feeling of embarrassment also coming up. So that's how interesting it is, right? If we talk about, uh, whiteness, because I'm also a white person. Uh, of course, um, but that's, uh, I find it interesting to um, be aware of that. 
uh, I worked in a multicultural organization for a long time. And I remember that our headquarters was in uh, Rotterdam, big city in the Netherlands. Uh, and I was always uh, working in Rotterdam and um, we had our own office there. So it was always, we were like, you know, familiar with the office. We had our own space and it was just uh, our place. And then one day, I sometimes also, we had also offices in different, three different cities in the Netherlands. So I remember one day that I had an appointment with one of my colleagues in the office of my hometown. And that particular office was part of a different broadcaster, a regional broadcaster who gave us space in their building. And that regional broadcaster was actually, there were only actually white people working there. So when you would enter the building, there would be, um, you know, a desk with two white women um, um, welcoming you. There would be a whole newsroom with only white journalists. And we would, uh, we had rented a space there for our multicultural radio station uh, where, uh, so it was really, we were really the multicultural people, you know, like the, so not me, of course, but as part of the team. Um, yeah, there would be people, uh, my colleagues from different uh, cultural backgrounds, different skin colors. So uh, I noticed also that how other people um, looked at us sometimes. But what I, I remember, so I had this um, appointment with my colleague. He is from Suriname background. And I noticed that when he came to the building, he was welcomed at the desk, reception desk, and they had to phone me to pick him up because there were some security doors. Um, and then I walked up the stairs and I saw him um, standing at the desk. And suddenly I thought, oh, he looks really different in this environment uh, with his uh, darker skin color, his hoodie, his sneakers. Uh, he looked a little bit, he, he felt a little bit uncomfortable because it was, uh, and you could see it, you know, from his, um, uh, from how he was uh, uh, standing there uh, because it was a new building for him. So he never been uh, at that location uh, before, but I caught myself, I, I really remember this moment that I um, saw him through the window before I welcomed him and I, and I just was, suddenly aware of the fact how he as uh, a black person also suddenly for a few seconds looked different to me in this whole uh, different uh, setting of white people and that's just one example of how I became uh, yeah also aware of hey I'm so used to him and we know each other and we have fun together etc he's my colleague and suddenly I saw him in a way that, um, yeah, he's um, black people are portraits in our uh, culture, I guess. So, when these thoughts came up, what happened um, inside of you? Um, did you have to look and see where it came from? Yeah, I think it was. It was very. Um, it was very short, of course, and I was immediately welcoming uh, him like, hey, there you are, and let's go uh, back to our uh, space. Um, I think what I, what I realized, maybe not exactly in that moment, but I mean, I still remember it very clearly. Um, what I realized that if you want to get rid of or let's say if you want to work on your blind spots because i'm i'm not saying that i'm completely i don't have blind spots anymore you need to do an effort to um, do that to approach someone who doesn't look like you in the same way as someone who does look like you and uh, i think that was the realization i had when i saw him standing there that I was at that point, because I was working in that envi environment for a few years al already, I was very, um, uh, how to say, I was very, I was of course normal and relaxed amongst my colleagues. But before I came to work in an in a, um, uh, environment like that, I would also maybe um, 
uh, if a black person would stand there in a, with a hoodie, I would also maybe feel a little bit shy or think like, oh, uh, do what should I say to him? I don't know him and have this, um, yeah, kind of image uh, that he he might be very, very different and have has different values than I have or all these kind of things. Um, and I just noticed at that moment you when you just connect with someone immediately by you know looking in the eyes and just uh, focus on the similarities you have instead of the differences uh, that that's just so very important um, yeah and I think a lot of times that doesn't happen because I think when we approach people who are unfamiliar to us we a lot of times um, maybe have these prejudices in our heads uh, of, oh, um, this person might be uh, different, um, uh, less this or more that, or, and then start also a different conversation. And I taught myself to approach people who look different than me as if they were, could be my best friends. And it's not even different skin color. I think it also works with, um, uh, or it works. It, I don't mean like it works, like it, it works, but uh, in my head, it also works with uh, people, uh, homeless people or people who I don't uh, automatically had in my um, community when I uh, grew up, for example. So you've been working a lot with uh, diversity and we, so we can start hearing different voices. Um, yeah. So what's happening there? Because it does seem that we don't, there's so many people who have things to say, but maybe they don't have the space to say it or they're not being allowed to say it. So why is there this lack of diversity? Why is the lack of diversity yeah. in media? Yes. Uh, oh yeah, it's... Um, I think it's a multi-level uh, problem, uh, to be honest. Um, I think it has a lot to do with um, the fact that if you have a wide newsroom and it's always been like that and you're looking for different people, uh, it has to do with the thing that I was at the point I was explaining before. If you approach people who are really different than you, you, you have these prejudices that they uphold maybe different values and et cetera, et cetera. So you think they probably won't match in our organization. So if you're not aware of those blind spots, the newsroom will stay white because you will always hire people who look like you or you, know, uh, you think look like you. Uh, so it's partly a, a lack also of a long-term uh, strategy because if you would have a long-term strategy thinking about, hey, but my newsroom needs to reflect society and how does it reflect society if the whole newsroom is white? Um, we need people uh, with other different uh, cultural backgrounds. Then it becomes a whole different approach. But I think a lot of times in journalism, that long-term strategy on that specific topic is not really there and that also has to do with uh, I think um, that it's not if you're not aware of what you're missing um, yeah you don't you don't know that you're um, that you uh, yeah if you're not aware of what you're missing you're not aware of what you're missing you know so yeah it's um that's complicated. I mean, people, newsrooms become aware at a point where, for example, Black Lives Matter, and then they think, oh shit, yeah, our newsroom is also white. Oh shit, we have to do something about it. But this happens every, every three years, you know, uh, if, uh, or every five years. And then the whole discussion about media diversity comes up again. But it has, of course, um, to do with a lot more different topics, not just when it's about uh, racism. It also has to do with uh, like the normal journalism uh, or news topics where you want to be a reflection of society. And if you never think about it in that way, um, yeah, nothing really will change. 
So what's happened, um, have you had any cases where you've spoken to other journalists who are not aware of their biases and not aware of their blind spots? Uh, yeah. What's happened? Yeah, so that's actually, um, yeah, for me, it's it's so interesting to have uh, to been able to work in this multicultural um, radio station for such a long time. It's called Funix, by the way, F-U-N-X, and they play great music. So if you're interested, you can go to their website. <laughs> it's maybe good to plug them a little bit. Um, but when I was working there, we um, we discuss a lot of, um, uh, I'd say, uh, news topics also with our audience of young people in um, big cities. Uh, so we would have reporters, radio reporters. That's also how I, how I, uh, I started uh, at the radio station. So I would go out every day with my um, a recording set and a microphone and go on the street and ask uh, young people about all different topics. So it would be like, it could be politics, uh, but also it could be their own personal financial situation or their uh, relationship with the family or their sex life or, you know, all different kind of topics. So we would have um, an editorial team where the reporters were also part of. And then we had a meeting every uh, week, a big meeting where we would uh, define the topics for uh, that week. So, um, and then in the four different cities where the radio station was broadcasting, we um, had reporters uh, going out on the streets every single day. So imagine what an investment it is in your in your audience, right? If you're visible for them every single day, they see you not just interviewing people on, um, uh, at schools, but also they see you traveling uh, in, the, um, uh, in the public transport. They see you go to events because we did all these kind of things. So it was really being very present in that particular city where we worked. Um, and of course there, were, there was also regional and um, national media who were of course also uh, working in these cities uh, sometimes. So I had, when in my years as an uh, editor in chief, I was six years editor in chief of that radio station. Uh, I would get invites from um, regional media companies and they would ask me like, hey, um, we are going to do this and that uh, topic in uh, this particular neighborhood. Uh, is it okay if one of your reporters uh, goes with us to report on this topic? Because if we go with our uh, journalist, we're not uh, accepted in that neighborhood. That would be like sometimes the question uh, I get. Uh, and then um, we would never do that because um, I mean, um, it really comes down to building trust with a certain neighborhoods. And obviously this was also a, a race thing uh, where their white journalist wasn't uh, comfortable going to a certain neighborhood where, for example, mainly uh, black people live or um, uh, people from uh, um, uh, Moroccan or Turkish descent where we have a lot of um, uh, a big group of people uh, from Morocco and Turkish uh, descent in the Netherlands. Um, so, you know, it would be minority neighborhoods and this white journalist never invested in that neighborhood because the news just uh, reports on things when things uh, go wrong, right? And we would report on things when things go wrong, but also on, posit on normal days, we would be interested in what our audience has to say. So we had built this relationship of trust. So uh, I would explain to these um, organizations also, like we're happy to help you to solve this problem for the long term, but I cannot just put my reporter in with your um, team working for your brand that hasn't built this same trust relationship, uh, you know, and then play with uh, the trust um, issue. Uh, that's not a good idea. So um, yeah, and I, yeah, I would explain uh, that it takes 
long-term commitment and investing in certain people if they are not the same as uh, you are. So um, yeah, that's happened a few times, definitely. A lot of times actually, regularly, yeah. Yeah. Because I guess um, you need to go through to understand the people you're speaking to and yeah. listen to different communities, you will see the world in a different way. So if you don't go through that challenge, how do you learn? Yeah. And the first contact is a great learning experience, isn't it? So if this journey yeah. is not going through that, how are they going to learn? And also yeah. going through that, they learn about their own biases as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I'm, to be honest, like, I'm actually quite surprised that there are not more journalists who are doing that, you know, because if you work in journalism, the core of your um, work is actually to be uh, able to tell the right stories. Uh, so it doesn't really, I can't really understand why you don't invest yourself also in your personal life to get a better understanding of certain communities in society that you don't have a good understanding of right now. You know, it's the same as um, if you are researching a certain topic, you also go to speak to different people and do your research, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that's something that's um, quite surprising uh, to me. And um, uh, I'm not saying that it doesn't happen at all, but uh, I do think that it's still quite a big uh, blind spot for a lot of uh, journalists in that sense. And, you know, it's also, um, I think it's also important to look at the bigger context of uh, the story. It's not so much about the individual journalists, it's the whole uh, system of journalism that, you know, it's so much focused on, especially now in the digital age to, you know, to be the first one uh, with the breaking news, to uh, create a story that is uh, almost clickbait, you know, that it's interesting enough for people to click on it and uh, read it or watch it. Um, so I think there are more and more initiatives, uh, media initiatives, uh, outside of the mainstream media that focus more on long-term commitment and a very strong engagement with their audience. So uh, I'm very happy to see that development as well. But I think if we're talking about the mainstream media, it's just not, um, it's, it's going in the opposite uh, direction. Um, which is really sad because in the end of the day, they do reach a huge audience, you know, so yeah. What's your thoughts about writers, journalists, filmmakers, anybody in the creative field um, reporting on a story, but it coming from what we call the white savior um, complex? <laughs> yeah. well, they're going to save. So have you got any thoughts about that? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about that. You mean, uh, do you also think now of uh, white journalists going to other countries or? Yes, I mean, so yeah. Uh, if you're a journalist going to another country and you're reporting on the usual um, theme of that country, maybe a poorer country, and you implant yeah. yourself into that story as if you're the one saving these people. Yeah. Or, you see it kind of in photography where um, a white journalist goes there and they're in the middle surrounded by a group of uh, yeah. people, Africans, you know. It's this kind of thing where they become central to the story. Yeah. And I'm sure there are hundreds, thousands of people who can tell the same story, but from their perspective. Yeah. I think that many people go there and they put themselves in the story. I discovered this, I find that, and also this is what they want. This yeah. is what they would like, speaking on behalf of them. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is one of the, this is a very big uh, problem. And it's, uh, it has a lot to do with kind of this macho culture in journalism, which is 
been mentioned now a few times also in um uh, if if we in in the journalism community talk about mental well-being then the macho culture is also sometimes discussed you know because you cannot have a burnout you need to be tough you need to be like you're this person who brings this important story back to the newsroom so and that actually that kind of uh, culture has very much to do with uh, white saviorism uh, what you're mentioning as well um, and um, I think I, um, I interviewed uh, Alan Soon a few months ago. He is from the Splice Newsroom in Singapore. Uh, he's an Asian um, journalist, uh, obviously, because he's from Singapore. Uh, but he was talking about um, uh, how we still parachute Western journalists into other countries. So that's how that's been called like parachuting journalist which is literally you know when uh, shit hits the van in some of the countries outside of uh, the west you just uh, grab a plane you fly there and you maybe talk have a chat have a quick chat with the taxi driver and uh, the manager of your hotel and then from your balcony you're doing your first uh, live report right <laughs> as if you are you know what is happening there mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, this is a very familiar concept that's um, uh, that's been written and criticized also by a lot of journalists uh, already. Like there's a Dutch uh, journalist, anthropologist, he's been a correspondent in the Middle East for a few years. And he wrote a book about this, um, also saying that he, a lot of times, got more information from uh, the editorial desk in the Netherlands than what he gathered himself being in Cairo, you know, because I mean, you're just one person, you need to have like a lot of uh, sources uh, immediately to get on top of a certain topic. So, and with internet and everything, if someone in the Netherlands just Googles uh, um, a lot and uh, finds the right sources, then this person probably has more information. So. Uh, yeah, that's um, that's a very famous issue. There's also there are also initiatives that um, more Western newsroom try to collaborate with uh, local journalists uh, on the ground. And I think the most uh, funny example for me and also a uh, valuable example is um, the uh, Kenyan journalist uh, Larry uh, Madowo, and I wrote about him uh, one week or almost two weeks ago, uh, an article, because he's a Kenyan journalist and he works for as a North America correspondent for uh, BBC. And he uh, reported on the US election. And I thought his reporting was so, I mean, he's, first of all, he's a great journalist. But it was also so funny because he, of course, coming from Africa, he also made jokes like, oh, oh my God, I reported on uh, elections in Africa that were more trustworthy than the ones now in the US, you know? So it was just hilarious how he also used his fun and humor uh, to, as a, a black, one of the only black correspondents also, to report on uh, the big uh, US. So yeah, those kind of things are uh, happening uh, or those kind of things. I mean, it's so valuable that a person like him got this uh, position and that he also uses the humor to uh, let us reflect on that, you know, because um, uh, he would also say things uh, like, uh, you know, um, people would make jokes also that now people from Africa will fly into the US <laughs> to report uh, <laughs> the situation, which which almost never happens, you know, but it just gives an idea like, okay, so this never happens. There's also a beautiful uh, set, satire uh, piece, a written piece by the South African author, uh, Sisonke Mismang, and she wrote <laughs> about, <laughs> it's hilarious, about how uh, this aid program was um, started by Africans to save uh, the US from their situation. And it's satire because the way she wrote it is actually exactly how the US would save uh, an African country when uh, there uh, was uh, going to be a coup or uh, whatever, you know. So. 
yeah, I'm so I'm very happy with that we hear these kind of voices much more, and that uh, that that they reflect on the the white supremacy and the Western uh, superiority. So, yeah. So, how do you personally navigate that space? Because I'm sure you're speaking on issues from people in Africa and Asia and so on. So how do you yeah. navigate that space of not becoming this voice of, you know what these people are doing? How do you yeah, do yeah. that? No, so I'm actually thinking like, uh, I mean, I don't, I'm in, an, uh, in Bali now in Indonesia, but I'm actually not fond of foreign correspondence, you know, in that sense uh, of people who, um, yeah, I think you should, I'm not so, I'm not looking for, um, to be that reporter, let me put it like that. Uh, I really see myself working on a more like meta field of journalism now where um, I use my experience as um, a, a white person who was um, confronted with her blind spots while working in journalism. And I really want to use that experience also to um, improve the um, uh, profession uh, and to help other journalists to look differently. And I also really learned that it's really not about me, you know, what's, what is really important is to highlight other voices. So I try to, uh, I interview quite a lot of uh, journalists from Asia uh, and or for example the article I wrote about uh, Larry uh, Madoa who's then Kenyan but I analyzed all his tweets and uh, Instagram uh, posts uh, and that for me I love that kind of work to put him in the spotlight uh, and show other people what we can learn from his perspective being an African in that specific uh, position or uh, I, uh, someone like Alan Soon, you know, who then tells me how he is annoyed about uh, parachute journalism. And he was also telling me how he's invited to European journalism conferences often, and he's often the only Asian person there, which annoys him as well. But he's a very positive person. So I, I, I don't think he will ever uh, say on stage that he's annoyed uh, by that. He's too polite for that, I think. But, uh, but I do know that he is, um, you know, he does share it in an interview when you, when you ask him about that. He does share that. And I think that's really important. Um, and also uh, Malaysian data journalist, uh, who has worked in U.S. newsrooms uh, and now has a successful own uh, uh, data startup for journalists uh, in Asia. And he uh, can also reflect on his work and his experience being an Asian person in America. And um, yeah, these kind of stories, there are so many people like this where Western journalists uh, can learn from. And that's actually where I really want to focus on. Um, and um, I think when it comes to reporting about uh, a country like Bali or Indonesia, or not a country like Bali, <laughs> a country like Indonesia. Some people think Bali is a country. Um, I don't want to be one of them. Uh, but uh, I think that should be done by Indonesian uh, journalists because there are a lot of people very well uh, qualified fight uh, to do that. I'm not saying that a Western journalist could never do that, but I just think you should know very well your position also in um, the landscape of journalism. What you're saying just sounds like journalism. You tell the story, which is not mm -hmm. about you, it's the story. Yeah. Isn't that what really journalism is? So if there was real journalism, we would hear these stories. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, um, yeah, that's definitely what journalism is. And uh, luckily, there are still a lot of good journalists out there who understand that very well. Um, uh, I think when you're not, when you approach, and probably a lot of people who work in media also approach their work with that same attitude. But um, yeah, you need to be in that in the process of creating the story 
um, you need to question yourself all the time. And um, that's just something that's, uh, yeah, that's needed. And that's probably something that there's not always time to do that. Uh, people have blind spots. Uh, they're not willing to do it. They have other things. They don't see uh, the necessity or the, the they don't see the, uh, how to say, the, the damage they do when they uh, don't investigate uh, enough. So yeah, um, it is definitely the work of uh, a journalist. It's actually interesting that you're saying that because I, I do think sometimes in journalism also, we, we tend to intellectualize the discussion about media diversity or intellectualize the discussion about inclusion. Whereas it's really not rocket science, you know, it's actually really going back to the ethics of the profession. Uh, and um, yeah, if you call it inclusive journalism or solutions journalism or constructive journalism, it's, it's, it's like yoga, you know, it's, if you call it vinyasa or ashtanga or yin, it doesn't matter, it's still yoga. And that's with journalism as well. It's still the same base of ethics that lies uh, underneath. And I think more, more talking about ethics, more discussion of ethics, uh, could also really solve the problem of media diversity. Yeah, like you said, it's it's not, like you said in your words, rocket science. It's so simple. I mean, the world is diverse, yes? Yeah. And yet we seem to be having the same discussions that were happening 50, 100, 200, 300 years ago, the very yeah. same discussions. And like you said, it's not difficult to see that each person is unique in themselves, has a different voice, a voice that they can speak. So how do we go from what we have in racism, sexism and injustice to a system of justice where not a single person anywhere at all is harmed? And how can the media and how can writers, journalists be involved in that process? Yeah. Wow, what a question. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a very, very, very complicated question, of course, because it's like, how can we, how we, how can we enter world peace or so, you know, but um, um, I do think that, I mean, there's a lot, lot going on in my head right now, but um, I think one of the insights I also got through doing uh, this work is uh, that it is as important to focus on uh, the journalists who are willing to learn something as it is to the audience to learn more about how journalism works, so media literacy. Uh, and I think that's really important because uh, nowadays with the rise of fake news and with a lot of conspiracy theories uh, out there, uh, I noticed that the techniques of media or the, like the techniques or the theory or the, the tools of media literacy are super helpful also for the audience to uh, dissect a certain story or, you know, to understand like, oh, I see this white journalists among all these black African children and then not not to think like, oh, that's cool. He's helping Africa, but think why, why does this white person do, uh, why is he there? You know, is he, uh, did he flew in for just five minutes or does he live there a longer time or, you know, and, and, and just an example. But I mean, I think it's just as important to educate the audience about that um, as it is to focus on media, because I think I gave up on part of the media, especially mainstream media already, because I mean, we've been saying it both, uh, the discussion is um, held over and over again with the same arguments. So I'm really at the stage also that I'm thinking we need to think out of the box, literally, not the framework and the books that we are working and living in. We need people from outside of our framework. So new voices who can teach us something, 
but I think also focus on audience more than on uh, journalists and teach people how what is good journalism and um, so they can also make a different decision you know and um, in what they read and what they uh, watch I think that's very uh, yeah that's very important yeah it would be great. I mean, just to, if you're writing a story as a journalist, how you write it and how you go through it and how you see the story. Yeah. So to see the journey that you go through writing a story. Yeah. Because I don't think many of us know what no. the yeah, journalists see or do, or have they been there for two months and really researched, or have they just got up a plane and doing five minutes and getting out again? Yeah. That's already a huge difference, right? But you never read that uh, as a byline in an, or as a, a context in an article, uh, which makes a, a whole lot of difference. So, um, yeah, I think, and for example, a friend of mine, she's a journalist and she worked in uh, Afghanistan for a long time. And she also noticed how a lot of the reporting in global, big global media was sometimes solely um, um, based on uh, Western sources who would live maybe in uh, Afghanistan, but there would be articles spread by major media companies that would have only, um, yeah, Western um, uh, voices and not, um, not spoken to the local um, uh, people. Uh, and I actually, I made also an article uh, about a report that's been done in Bali here a few weeks ago, a few months ago already by Australian uh, media. Uh, and they made a whole report about how Kuta, which is a beach, beach town in the south of uh, Bali, was completely desolated because Australian tourists uh, aren't coming anymore. Um, but they would use constantly the word Bali instead of saying Kuta. So for them, Kuta is Bali. So that's the, that's already uh, one thing. Um, and then they spoke to three or four different people and none of them were Balinese. <laughs> and yeah. that was the report. <laughs> So, and when you see a report like that, you know, I mean, I, I can totally understand if you're not in Bali and you see it in the news, you're probably like, oh God, sad situation there. And it's not that it's not sad, of course, Kuta is sad, but it's not the whole story. And the situation is sad, but it's definitely not the whole story. And how can you say that you did ethical reporting if you didn't speak to one um inhabitant of uh, the island you know it's just amazing and i think when we create more articles like that when where or articles or whatever if we create a more information about this to the audience also explaining like look for this and this reason this was not good journalism then people also learn um how to um analyze uh, news in a better way and they start to ask more questions and I think you know critical thinking then becomes more um, uh, yeah more important again and I think that's very uh, yeah that could be great if we focus more on that because it's like sometimes when you hear um, a piece on Africa or a piece and they do a certain region in Africa and they take yeah. the whole, that means the whole of Africa. Yeah. A certain region of Asia, that's the whole of, of Asia. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> why is there still this blind spot? Because we live in Europe and we know that if you're born in London, it's very different to be born in, in uh, Luxembourg. It's different ways of being, different languages, different cultures, different ways of being. But it, they seem to be able to lump whole behaviors and activities to uh, billions of people. Yeah. Yeah, so what I think is really very important and that actually comes from my uh, Vipassana meditation where they explain there are actually three uh, types of truth. 
one is the truth you read in books one is the uh, truth you hear from speaking to other people and then the third one is the one that you experience yourself so it becomes a truth after you experienced it and something is only really uh, a true truth if you experience it yourself so if you just wrote uh, uh, read a book about it or just talking to other people uh, it cannot be uh, a truth for yourself yet uh, and i think this i really like this concept because i think this is exactly what is going on if you're saying how is it possible that people still have those blind spots they probably didn't travel uh themselves to asia or maybe on holiday but not in a way that they have engaged uh, in you know different uh, perspectives um and it's also the same as with the blind spots if you're if if it's about racism because if you weren't confronted by your blind spots directly um, in the situation um, with other people then it's very hard to realize that it's something um, that is uh, a truth you know so i think it has a lot to do with you experience it with your whole body uh, and then really understanding like, oh, shit, it's really something. And once that happens, you probably change something in your behavior as well. Uh, so I do think that that in a lot of cases is um, a missing link. And um, if people just stay in their own comfortable environment, in their framework uh, built upon whiteness, um, you know, how are you going to create that different perspective? It's very hard. So after we read your work, what questions do you think will be great for the reader to have for, for you? If we are reading a piece that you've written. I always love to answer questions. <laughs> I love to talk. <laughs> um, what, what questions? Well, I hope actually if people read my, it would be great if people have questions about uh, what I read, but I actually, I read, uh, oh, I write actually very much with the intention of giving some answers also, uh, you know, to give some, to shine some light on things that um, people might not have thought about before. So, a few of the articles I'm mentioning uh, are really based on analyzing certain topics and showing people like, see, if you analyze it, it really doesn't make sense, you know, or if you dissect this report and you see that there's only Western people speaking, it's, it's not ethical journalism or, um, yeah, so I, that's actually the idea with why I write is really to try to change the perspective um, of people. And it depends, of course, because I mainly write for, um, in my mind, for um, people who are maybe like me, but then 10 years ago, you know, who, who I yeah, would like to show like what I learned throughout the years and how I changed my perspective. Um, and maybe, yeah, I don't know if there are other people who have who could have other questions. Did you have questions if you when you read some of my work? Yeah, I just what you were just saying. I think um, if we read journalists and look at and maybe ask, what viewpoint are they coming from? Who are they writing for? Then we're not just ingesting their viewpoint or words. We're also empowering ourselves, not just totally believing what this person has read. So now we can come back yeah. to you and ask, okay, where did you get your information from? Did you visit yeah. this place? Who have you spoken to? And in that way, you're writing and we're inquiring, asking questions, and we're both growing. We're empowering yeah. each other. So if, if I'm yeah. speaking to you now and I'm here to ask, but Sana, where did you get your information from? Who did you speak to? 
and it's not yeah. seen as a negative it's seen as a growing so we we're both learning at the same time yeah yeah that's very interesting that you're mentioning this because um um I don't get that question so much, for example, if I talk about diversity, like where do you get that knowledge from? Uh, because I experienced it myself. So that's a kind of interesting. I don't even, I do, I mean, I do read a lot about the topic as well. So it's not just only experience. I mean, it's also history, right? Like what I read about uh, the race theory and how that got uh, spread in, at the moment when the US was built and how it became part of the constitution and all slavery history etc I mean we don't have to make things up right I mean it's all out there already um, but if it's about my experience uh, I really talk from years and years of experience in working in inclusive media also so um, yeah, that's, but at the same time, actually, you also make me think because um, it's also, yeah, it, it would be, I mean, I would like people to have more trust in media instead of less trust in media. So, and I'm a little bit, I'm now thinking like it should not become too much um, a story of, okay, but this is your experience and this is my experience and we both have our different truths, you know? Because at one point that's definitely true, but there is also um, uh, still, there's still also the, uh, the facts out there, right? And um, the good journalism work where you hear both parties and you uh, write your story based on what you hear from both sides. And um, yeah, I think we should still work towards um, creating a certain common ground for people to build society upon instead of um, separating from each other too much by saying, okay, this is your truth, this is my truth, because I think that's where we're heading at this moment. Also, you know, with uh, people with, for people who believe more um, news that, that goes more towards conspiracies, for example, um, they would, that's also sometimes a discussion I have with people who uh, don't believe that COVID exists, for example, that they, they will say, yeah, but this is what you believe and this is what I believe. And we both have our different sources. And I think that's at some point that's a little dangerous as well because then we separate more from each other whereas we need to find each other in a certain common ground because we, yeah, we live in society together. Yes, I mean, um, I can't remember who it was now, says that sometimes um, it's to the discussion, so you go back to the science of it, not because sometimes truths can change over generations of time. But if we yeah. discuss together, go to the science of it, to the actuality of it, then all our kind of different opinions um, kind of can fall away. And we can actually, if we don't come with an agenda, Let's learn together and find out the roots of it, the source of it. Yeah, I think that's very important. But, but this, for example, this also means that sometimes as a journalist, you need to be willing to say, hmm, I changed my mind. Or, um, you know, if I think about the report I did 10 years ago, it wasn't actually really good because I wasn't very well informed. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and I mean, yeah, do we hear this a lot in journalism? No. <laughs> so, you know, this is also something that um, we need to be willing to say that. And I think that's also now actually going on with, um, yeah, with a lot of topics where journalists are sometimes the first to condemn people or to say like, 
oh, it's so stupid that you believe this, or it's so dumb that you do this or that, whereas uh, it is, um, it should be the journalist who tries to understand why people do what they do, you know, and um, be also willing to learn um, uh, from other people, um, yeah. Because in one way, it's really strange. I mean, um, I, I thought something 10 years ago, but now I've learned and I've grown and I now have more information. So yeah. it seems to be that's kind of the very against learning and educating yourself. If we refuse to say, oh, I was, I was wrong, I made a mistake because isn't that how we evolve as human beings? by yeah. making errors and then years later we say i would never do that again or act that way again and that's great yeah because now yeah. you learned it is a fear yeah. of being wrong a fear of losing faith yeah. yes yeah exactly and also fear of losing trust you know i mm. think and i think sometimes that's also a misconception that you think when you admit that you were wrong that people won't come back to you again whereas probably the opposite is true um and i'm also i mean i also have to say it's not that it never happens you know there are definitely media organizations media platforms and journalists who do admit um when they're wrong but um i do think that we that Mm, we tend to also then very easily forget uh, or we don't really research the pattern uh, below that wrong or beneath that wrongdoing. So, uh, for example, well, an example is, for example, the Iraq war, where uh, politicians also uh, told us lies uh, about the reason why we should go to why as Western people you know, Europe and the US, we, why we should go to war in uh, Iraq. And of course, media has, has plays a, a huge role in that. Um, and I think there are definitely media who say like, oh yeah, we should have, uh, maybe they, there are definitely also media who reported at that moment already saying, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't make any sense, etc. But there is definitely also a big part of media who at some point also supports a government decision or at least just takes the decision for uh, truth and then from there the, uh, they do the reporting so don't they don't question the initial action anymore um, they just take the fact that we go to war as something that's that is happening so from there we are going to report in the best possible and critical way maybe as we can but we are not going to question the initial uh, why of the war anymore um, and sometimes that's also hard because the information comes over years uh, but i do think that we um yeah that that it's important to then analyze what were the why didn't we do more at that time? You know, what were, um, uh, what did lead us towards this kind of um, reporting that we were very much on the side of the government? And, and then when another big event happens or uh, we go to war again in five or 10 years, you as a organization learn from that and you know that the same kind of pattern is still going on. Uh, and that a lot of times doesn't happen. And I think that's actually also has also to do with um, whiteness and uh, the Western superiority feeling and the feeling of the West having to save the world, you know, with our, um, yeah, with our society, that our values are more better than the values in the rest of the world. Senna. Where do you go from here in your meditation, spiritual work, and your work on diversity in journalism to create this world of justice where not a single person is harmed, where these divisions 
most of them were created. Whiteness has been created. Race has been created. Where, yeah. where do you go from here in creating this world of justice? Yeah, so for me uh, personally, what I really discovered is that um, I uh, that it's very important for me to constantly work on compassion towards other people. Uh, because on this topic, it's very easy to become very angry <laughs> on things that never change or people who don't see their own blind spots or people who aren't willing to do the work. And it's very easy to just you know, become angry at that and then uh, start communicating about it in a kind of aggressive way uh, instead of uh, training and working on your own compassion for other people and work from uh, that place. I think that's very important. And that's also where meditation for me is uh, directly uh, linked. So uh, to keep up with my uh, meditation practice, uh, to stay also aware of uh, my own um, body, actually, that's the main, uh, yeah, that's the main thing that um, I get from meditation um, or the main thing. I mean, that's where my meditation techniques, Vipassana uh, works um, or focuses on. and. Um, yeah, that's very, for me, the Vipassana is very important to keep doing this uh, work and to um, maintain my own inner peace <laughs> so I can still have compassion uh, for other people. Because I do think if we don't have compassion towards others anymore, we also lose the interest in reaching out to other people, you know? And I think we need much more people who build bridges we also need the activists don't get me wrong the activists who are uh, shouting and screaming and um, making their point and i definitely am one of them uh, sometimes as well but we also need people for the long term to slowly slowly build uh, bridges and i think that's something that i want to focus on for myself as well yeah, because the activism can be such a great part of the uh, spiritual journey. It doesn't have to be something yeah. different. It can be brought right into center of it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Only I, you know, I, I just think that um, we also need to be aware of the fact that. Uh, there's different uh, types of activism, you know, and different moments of activism. I think when you, um, yeah, I think the long-term thinking is not always uh, there. And when, you know, when you, it's so, you know, it's so easy to just be very angry <coughs> and make your point. That's not so hard because, you know, you're, you're probably right. If, it, you know, if you're an anti-racist uh, racist, uh, activist, you're probably right and you already uh, know because you opened your eyes. Um, so I think as an activist at that moment, you also then have to think about like, but who, who am I preaching for? And I think a lot of people, um, also now social media activism, they get a lot of likes and a lot of shares, but you, I think it's also, interesting to ask yourself all the time like is it still the audience that i want to reach or am i preaching for my own people um and i think it's uh, yeah it's it's easy to uh to just shout at someone who you don't agree with uh it's much much harder to have a conversation with that same person you know and to maybe also listen sometimes um i don't i'm not saying that we should have uh, tolerance towards uh, racism or um etc or that we should 
listen to the opinion of a racist because I mean, there, we shouldn't discuss racism. Um, it's just that I think as an activist, you always need to ask yourself, who are you speaking to? And is that, is the, yeah, are you ventilating your own anger towards someone? Or are you trying to bring this message and be very constructive for the long term? That's, I think, yeah. I wrote actually an article about this last week uh, because I was confronted with um, this topic for myself in a few different situations that I noticed that I need to develop some more compassion. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, I think that's important for everyone to ask uh, themselves because if you, you know, we don't want to push people more away from each other. We also want to see if there's a common ground. Uh, So is this fueling your meditation practice? Is this what? Is this fueling your meditation practice coming up? Uh, yeah, this is, well, um, yeah, it's more that I notice that regular meditation is important in order to develop compassion for others. So it's not like that in the idea of my meditation is that I don't think so much about specific situations, but by doing the technique, you automatically work on your own inner peace. And if you work on that, it will uh, also work on uh, other aspects uh, in your life. Uh, so I think just to maintain a regular practice that already can be quite a challenge, um, you know. So uh, I think that's, uh, that's just important to do the meditation in the way you want, but just to have this regular practice, uh, that's uh, most important. Sana, was there anything you wanted to say that we didn't get, get, get around to speaking about? Mm, no, I don't. No, I think it was. It's yeah. It's always nice talking to you. <laughs> and yeah, we spoke about a lot of things. Uh, I hope it was clear. Do you? Ha yeah, I hope it was clear what I had to say about uh, things. And I write about the topic as well, so people can um, also um, write, uh, read more about it if they want. But uh, no, I don't have anything else to say at this moment. Well, uh, thank you, Senna. I really enjoyed the conversation. Um, just just speak with you, Same. And hearing your points of points of view is really great. And I think we could go on for ages. <laughs> so much, that we, yeah. yeah. So many avenues we could get down. But uh, yeah. Senna, yeah. I'll put into the links if anybody wants to contact you. If you like the Instagram or email or anything like that, I put it in the links. Yeah. Yeah, please, uh, maybe my newsletter, if people yes. want to subscribe, the Inclusive Journalism newsletter and uh, Instagram account. And people can always send me a direct message through Instagram as well. So uh, that would be great. Okay, well, thank you for listening to Ranusha's conversations on the spiritual journey with Sana today. Uh, like I said, if you want to hear Sana's journey, that's in the previous video. But um, thank you very much, Gwen Rising Sana. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you.